What you're about to see is Switzer TV property, which is shown on Thursdays on our YouTube channel. And this is the show where we try to make you an expert on property, and we do that by seeking out the expert who can make you So welcome, Steve. Welcome, Chris. Uh, let's just start this debate off this way. Um, the, the more controversial character in the debate has to be you, Steve, because last time we talked, you still believed a 40% fall in house prices was on the card. Well, first I'd say I love Steve, uh, he's a good mate, um, but this is a debate, I've got to take off the gloves. Uh, I think we're gonna have some serious intellectual fisty cuffs, uh, especially after I dusted up uh, Steve's acolyte, John Adams, on the- <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Come on, come on, come on. So, so welcome, Steve. Welcome, Chris. Uh, let's just start this debate off this way. Um, the, the more controversial character in the debate has to be you, Steve, because last time we talked, you still believed a 40% fall in house prices was on the cards. Mm -hmm. You've seen a comeback in house prices uh, in uh, Australia, and it looks like to me a bottoming. What is your current position on what you think will happen to Australian house prices? Well, I think it would actually, if you know, there's a, there's a satirical uh, Twitter account called Professor Demographics, and uh, she uh, made the uh, very witty re remark that this was a Schrodinger's cat bounce. So uh, if you look what happened, was happening before the election and before the um, uh, Royal Commission's report came out, everything was pointing to a slowdown in credit growth. And to me, as you know, that the main factor determining house prices is the rate of growth of new mortgages. And that was looking on a hiding to nothing to continue declining. It already reached its own peak, was falling from 2016. And that's what ultimately drives house prices down. Uh, then you had the Royal Commission on top of that, which basically put the kibosh on irresponsible lending uh, for about three weeks. <laughs> then you have, first of all, the unexpected re-election of, uh, of Morrison, which I think turned everybody's expectations about negative gearing and so on around. Um, and then the report comes out for the Royal Commission, written by the Treasury rather than by uh, Rowena, uh, uh, Rowena Orr, would have been in a totally different document, a damp squib compared to the inquiry itself. And uh, finally, within, you know, within months of that uh, irresponsible lending being finally focused upon, uh, the government's coming out saying, please get back to irresponsible lending. And yet that the, 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 the Wagyu and Shiraz judgment as well. So I think that's all spiked people to dive back into the market. And, uh, and that will clearly cause prices to rise for a while. But the ceiling that I see to house prices is still there. And that is that Australia's level of household debt is the second highest on the planet. Um, it's it, to only Switzerland, and uh, mate, that's your that's your um, home country's name, of course. And yes. we all know that. I mean, of course, you're a totally ethical financier, but we know there's some dodgy things done in Switzerland. So I'm uh, I'm one of my friends have told me that data in, involves a lot of overseas money. Uh, the debt, the debt that was shown there. So they're saying really in that sense, if you take out the, the idiosyncrasies of Switzerland, we're carrying the highest level of household debt on the planet. Certainly the worst, it's the second highest. And that that is so close to a ceiling, which we've already started to decline from. Uh, I, the only way you're going to see a sustained continued rise in house prices is if Australia continues rising in the house, household debt to GDP level. And I think we're basically at Mount Everest of that and we're not going to get much past it. So that's why I think the, the bounce will run out when, when, the, when the increase in credit causes increasing debt and pushes our debt service ratios even higher. Okay, so that's your, your opening ambit. Uh, Chris, you heard it all. What would you say to what you heard? Well, first I'd say I love Steve. Uh, he's a good mate, um, but this is a debate I've got to take off the gloves. Uh, this will be, um, I think we're gonna have some serious intellectual fisty cuffs, uh, especially after I dusted up uh, Steve's acolyte, John Adams on <laughs> the- oh, Please. <laughs> Absolutely. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, also See, let me throw in, Chris, I'd you've, never had, had, you've never had gloves in your entire life. life. I mean, John's yeah. a nice guy, I haven't met him, but uh, Martin I have met him, he's a nice guy. I'd rather go with John's analysis of Martin's analysis than John's, thank you very much. But anyway. Well, All right. I'm, happy okay, debate, I'm happy to debate uh, Martin. I haven't done so, of course, but it was a very, very one-sided affair. I think a first-round knockout with um, poor old John Adams. But 
Um, moving on to Steve, uh, of course, Steve and I have debated uh, several times in the past, and I think your question was opposite, uh, Peter. You know, does he hold true to his uh, sensational 2008 forecast for a 40% drop in Aussie house prices? Since that time, I think we very accurately uh, projected the ups and downs in Australian house prices. Um, since uh, Steve made those comments, which I think were featured on 60 Minutes, uh, scared the bejesus out of millions of Australians, Aussie house prices, they didn't fall 40%, they've actually risen 38%. Um, and indeed, they're 130% higher <clears throat> today than where Steve thought they would be today. Um, so I think it comes down to ultimately the... Now, when can I interrupt, by the way, to correct the well, factual well, detail? Let, let him finish first. Okay, there you go. Come back. Allow, going, allow me to be the referee, Steve. So and I, I, yeah, I got, you had a long intro. Let, 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 let him yeah, have yeah, his long intro fine, and come fine. back. Yep. Okay, I'll, I'll move to yep. you then, okay? Yep, so, sure. So, so I said publicly I expected a modest decline in house prices in 2008. They fell 7%. We were forecasting a 5 to 10% decline followed by a rapid rebound. They did rebound rapidly. As I mentioned, they're now 38% uh, higher than uh, their levels uh, prior to the global financial uh, crisis. Um, we also projected very strong growth following a, a modest correction between 2010 and 2012. In 2013, we said that we'd get double-digit house price growth as a result of uh, significant RBA rate cuts. The RBA um, ultimately cut the cash rate from 4.75% uh, to 1.5% um, in 2016. And we got that boom in house prices. Uh, we saw Sydney house prices rise as much as 50% from their trough in 2012. Um, but in April 2017, I wrote in the Financial Review whilst prices were still rising, um, Peter and Steve, that the boom's over, we're going to have a bust. I forecast a 10% decline in house prices in April 2017. <clears throat> and by April um, uh, 2019, they'd fallen 10.7%. This year, in April 2019, I said the bust is over. We're going to get a 10% increase in house prices. Uh, prices troughed in May. They started rising in June and July. Uh, Sydney and Melbourne have prices now up um, about 3% plus from their uh, 2019 Nadir. And we're very confident we're going to get strong house price appreciation of okay. 5 to 10%. Wait a second, of 5 to 10% over the 12 months following the second RBA rate cut. So there is not a snowball's chance in hell um, house prices are going to fall significantly in the short uh, to medium term. They will rise significantly. Um, uh, Steve talks a lot about this relationship between credit and house prices, but ultimately house price changes. The reason we've been able to forecast them so accurately over the last decade, uh, Peter, is they're a function of a range of different demand and supply variables. And ultimately, um, the serviceability of that debt is of paramount importance. And what we know today, Peter, is that before uh, the, the two most recent RBA rate cuts, households were only paying about 7.6% uh, uh, of their income in interest repayments. Basically the same amount of income that they were dedicating to debt uh, interest serviceability repayments that they were paying in December 2006, and actually not very different to what, almost identical to what they were paying in 2004. So the serviceability of debt hasn't really changed. The key point is, that the average mortgage rate in Australia between 1980 and 1993, when the RBA adopt, adopted an inflation target, was 13.3%. Since that time, it's averaged just over 7%. Our discounted mortgage rates today are about 3%. So the uh, typical mortgage rate in Australia has fallen by some 77%. And that is why you've had a big increase in debt. But the serviceability of that debt hasn't changed. And I think okay. Steve... Yep, you go. Okay, now Steve... Obviously, what Chris is saying is serviceability is more important than this ratio that you say leaves us basically uh, the highest in the planet when we compare uh, household uh, uh, debt to GDP. So what is your comeback to, to uh, Chris on the, the, um, rel the, the greater relevance of debt serviceability? Oh. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, first of all, go back to the record about that bloody bet, uh, because uh, if you actually listen to the parliament, parliamentary library recording where, where that was sprung on me uh, by Rory, uh, I said over the top of his statement, he said, you said prices are going to fall 40%. And I said over the top, quite audibly on the tape, for, over the next 10 to 15 years, mate, 
That was in 2008. So 2000 and I said over that period in 2023, over that time period, 10 to 15 years, that's what I said on the 730 report as well. I wasn't making a prediction about short term prices. And my focus really was on I think this is just an irresponsible way to run an economy. I couldn't give a rat's ass about the bet about the uh, the gambling side of all this, which seems to be an Australian obsession. It's that this is a lousy way to run an economy to be totally dependent upon rising house prices and credit. Now, if you want to go to what I predicted about house prices, uh, Pete, can you whack up uh, slide eight in the slide deck that I've sent you so we can see that on screen? Slide eight. OK, now that slide is my predictions for house prices, because what I've been fundamentally saying, what drives house prices is change in new mortgages. This is actually change in household debt, which is a better time series coming out of the Bank of International Settlements. But I think I do pretty well in saying what the ups and downs are. My argument about the role of credit in the setting house prices is quite strongly confirmed by that chart. Uh, if you can go back up one chart, you look at the American data. Now, nobody's debating that America had a house price crash and recovery, okay? Driven again by the same basic argument. And in terms of technicalities, I haven't had a chance to publish this because of uh, just ridiculous uh, writing a lot of work on other topics. But we've done Granger causality on this, which is an ex it's a technical and very poor way of testing uh, causality when you have a, 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 a thing like house prices and debt, where there is causation in both directions, but it's strongly have, confirmed that credit it drives house prices. Okay, well, Chris, hang on, Chris, let him finish off, then you, you can have your, yeah. your say on this one. Now, now what, that, what, that, what that leads to is the final, uh, if I go to the uh, chart number, where are we, chart number 10. Yes, it's true, the interest rate component of servicing has fallen because of falling interest rates, but nonetheless, you include uh, a good estimate of the cost of principal repayment, and that's the, the data for household debt service ratios around the world. Now, clearly, we don't hold the, the all-time record. That belongs to Denmark. But on the BIS database, the debt service ratio for Australia is now the highest on the planet. That's just a, a sample in, in terms of the average. In, in, they don't have data on Switzerland, unfortunately, but uh, that's the story. We've got the highest level of debt service on the planet. Um, so I think the argument is that, yes, the interest is serviceable works so long as you can assume people don't have to pay their household debt back. Now, if it's, if we get all these myths about government having to pay its debt back. It doesn't. Uh, but households ultimately do. And it's a double serviceability. So it's saying the house, Australian households are devoting less now than they did at the time of the financial crisis much the same as they did back in 2006, slightly higher, but it's the highest on the planet. Nobody else has sustained a debt level like a service level like that and kept going. Okay, Chris, um, okay. That's so the, the issue. We just, we've got into yeah. an unsustainable position. All right, so you made, you've, made, you've made your point. Yep. You've, you've shown charts to justify it. Chris, you've seen those. What's your, your reply? Yeah, okay. And I, I didn't interrupt Steve because I'm a very polite character. So if, we just go back to his, if we go back to his slide eight, please. Yep. Um, so looking at household credit and house price changes, he, he says he's a great forecaster, but I don't see any forecast here for a 40% decline in house prices. No, it, it wouldn't be forecasting. I'm not forecasting. I'm simply saying that's the driving factor behind it. So if you want to have a continued house prices, you need continued credit growth. Why in 2008 were you forecasting a 40% decline in house prices over 10 years? I don't see on this chart. 10 to 15. Remote, what, fact, what, the, what, 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 what I wasn't. Interrupt. Sorry. Don't okay. interrupt. Don't interrupt. Yeah. I can't see anything remotely resembling a 40% reduction in house prices according to his own alleged forecasting model. The, the worst drawdown that I can see on this data that I'm looking at here um, is about 10% in, um, in, in 2008. So he doesn't have any analytical basis for a 40% decline in house prices. And as we know... It's not analytical, it's got feeling. Don't interrupt, don't interrupt. And since he made those claims, house prices have increased, um, as I mentioned, by some 38%. Um, and indeed, to be accurate to the 10-year forecast uh, that was published in, in 2008, he doesn't want to be held. Well, it's now 10 to 15 years, whatever. But in today's terms, um, Peter Switzer, that would represent a 56% reduction in house prices. Um, uh, so, so I think that um, th th there is no evidentiary basis for, for this uh, for this extremely pessimistic view. I can get pessimistic. As I explained to John Adams. And I, and I think I've uh, explained on your show in, in other uh, sessions, Peter, I can get very, very pessimistic about Aussie house prices. I can I can sort of conceptualise contingencies where house prices fall by 20 to 40% quite easily. Um, what you would need is a very large recession. Uh, you would need a big increase in unemployment um, and you'd need mass arrears. But what I know, to know as an empirical fact, and if we can bring up my chart 
Um, I think it is the first chart um, uh, on non-performing housing loans. There is a reason in, in the slide that, um, we won't go to it, but in that slide where um, Steve used the uh, BIS data on um, household debt service ratios and Australia's debt service ratio hadn't really changed for a decade, but it looked high. Um, one of the reason one of the reasons our debt service ratio has been so high is Australia has historically had amongst the highest interest rates in the OECD. For a very, very long time, we've been known as a high yield uh, currency. And the reason people have used the Aussie dollar as a carry trade is because of that um, very high level of interest rates in Australia. Um, and that has been true up until recently. So we've seen the RBA cut the cash rate um, from, uh, I think it was at uh, north of 7% in uh, 2008 to now uh, 1% and it's likely they'll cut the cash rate to 0.75% in October. And so that debt service ratio that does look high is now dropping like a stone uh, because interest repayments are going to be dropping like a stone. Uh, the data that I quoted you that, you know, houses are only spending about 7% of their income to service debt interest repayments, that was before the two RBA rate cuts, notwithstanding that that 7% is the same level that it was in 2006 and indeed 2004. Um, so the point of the non-performing housing loan chart is that if Aussie banks were lending irresponsibly, if households couldn't service their debts, what you would see is because we have very we have had historically, um, Peter and Steve, over the last 30 years in Australia, very high global mortgage or mortgage rates um, uh, relative to global standards, you, you should see some evidence in, in the arrears rates of that stress, and we're not seeing that. So what Australian households have shown is um, notwithstanding a big increase in the jobless rate in Australia in 1991 um, and, and some stress in 2008, Aussie mortgage rates have been amongst the lowest, sorry, Aussie mortgage default rates have been amongst the lowest in, in the developed world, substantially lower than what we saw in the US, UK and Spain. And that's why, um, for example, securitized Aussie home loans, um, you know, global investors aren't completely stupid and Aussie banks and non-bank lenders have sold over $100 billion dollars of securitized Aussie home loans since January 2017. And the reason global investors are buying these securities is because um, they very, have very, very high credit quality and households have incredibly low arrears rates, notwithstanding those historically and globally elevated mortgage rates. Now those mortgage rates, you can now get a 3%, um, I think you can, you can actually get a two handle on a mortgage rate in Australia and they will continue to fall as the RBA continues to cut the cash rate. So I have absolutely, well, my, my, my closing comment on this section would be, I have absolutely no concerns whatsoever about debt serviceability right now. I can get very negative. My forecast is house prices will increase by at least 10% in the next 12 months. And, and the evidence thus far is uh, suggesting that is absolutely playing out after a, a very large correction. I emphasize okay. again, okay. Is, uh, house prices fell by 11% between 2017 and 2019, exactly what we projected. Um, and that was important and cathartic, but we're now seeing a clear recovery. I don't think we need to um, uh, remind people how brilliant your forecasting is, Chris. You've done that so many times, no one <laughs> will ever forget it. But, but the, the point, I think, is a really on this chart, Steve, which you can see, because mm. one of the questions I, I put to you when we last spoke was, you know, um, could the Australian situation just be different? That we're, we are a different property market. And looking at that, the US and Spain, and, and you actually made the comparison. You, you said there's no real argument to believe that we are any different than, say, the mm. USA or Spain or Ireland, where these sorts of 40, 30 40% falls in house prices have, hap have happened. But looking at that chart, we don't have a history of non-performing housing loans like the Yanks had um, in 2009, 2010, and like the Spanish. What would you say to that? That's after the bloody crisis, for God's sake. Um, that's the, the, the house prices in America started falling about 2006. Uh, the credit dynamic kicked in well before then. House, house, it's easy to have low non-performing housing loans while you can still flip and get out of your troubles, which is what lots of people were doing in America as a lifestyle, and Australia's made it into a national characteristic. Um, so, so long as the house prices are rising, you get that result. When they start to fall and people who are could otherwise get out by selling in a rising market no longer can. That's when those defaults rise. That is a classic lagging indicator. So it's saying, you're saying, but, 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 you're saying but, but, Australia hasn't had a crisis yet. Yeah, but, but the history of non-performing loans in Australia, even today, 
it's still not a, at a worrying level at all, is it? No, it's not. I agree. It's something which is keeps masked by the fact that you can sell and get out of your property property trap. Uh, if you if you keep finding you you simply don't have the cash flow and, and looking at the level of irresponsible lending in Australia and we've got it we've got it in black and white courtesy of that NAB document I sent you recently um, that there are people who can't afford not forget Wagyu beef they can't forget they can't afford a McDonald's hamburger but they can get out of trouble while house prices are rising once they stop rising on a sustained basis and that's when you start getting when you your credit powers drop dropped out of the system then you see the rise in non-performing loans. Well, over yeah. the years, yeah. over the years, you and I have actually you know, debated, you know, when Armageddon should should happen. And I often mm. would ar argue that, well, macro policy can get in the way of your Armageddon yeah, scenario. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right. So, and, and I think that's the bottom line at this point in time. Can I, can I just go back to Chris for a second? Chris, can you see the Armageddon scenario happening? outside of a, a significant global recession that then hits Australia and we see 10% unemployment? Well, Peter, just you know, go back to first principles and, and taking a step back. These discussions and debates are very, very important because people listen to them. We know that, right? The last time we debated you know, John Adams, uh, hundreds of thousands of folks watched um, th that discussion. And you know, clearly, Steve uh, attracted enormous attention during the global financial crisis with his uh, forecast of a 40% drop in house prices. And people are actually acting actually acting on this information. So I think these forecasts are important. It's important that they have a, a credible basis. Um, and obviously, none of the empirical data that has uh, transpired since has, has supported uh, Steve's views. And I think where he struggles, and the essential flaw in his argument, is he can't find the catalyst. He can't find the trigger for this um, cataclysm. Cataclysm. So he can't find the what he doesn't know what's going to precipitate that that big, uh, you know, forty or now fifty six percent drop in house prices. That's why when we look at the relationship between credit and GDP, and he says that's my forecasting model, um, uh, and yet there's no evidence of a twenty, thirty, or forty percent drop in house prices in that data. Um, you know, that 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 is that's what explains the disconnect. He's missing the causality. Uh, so we need to sort search for that causality, and I think that's a very very legitimate dis discussion, which is I think kind of the question you asked me. I think another. Um, uh, misstep or flaw in, or vulnerability in Steve's analytical framework is in 2008 and today he kind of completely overlooks all of the policy reaction fun functions, so fiscal policy and monetary policy. It was clear the RBA was going to slash rates in 2008. It was clear that fiscal policy was going to provide a lot of support and it was clear that house prices were going to bounce back strongly in 2009 and 10, which is what they did. Um, I, I think house prices can fall 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, in the next recession, um, you know, I, I comfortably, again, we forecast that prices would drop uh, 10% in, in uh, early 2017. Um, and I think, you know, I think we will get a recession uh, eventually. And I think that Steve will actually will ultimately be vindicated partly in, in, in some of his views, as in we will eventually have a very large uh, drop in Aussie house prices. For me, the causality comes back to inflation. I think what's going to happen is that global central banks will continue to drive interest rates towards zero. They will continue to embark on this quantitative easing experiment where they're basically buying all assets to bid up their prices and reduce the cost of capital to instill confidence um, and encourage uh, you know, speculation, demand and, and activity. And they're hell bent on reducing global jobless rates, <clears throat> even though you know global unemployment rates in Canada, the UK, the US uh, and New Zealand and Australia are sort of all around or below their full employment rate levels. We've got clear wage inflation in the US back to kind of circa pre-crisis levels. So I don't think anyone's worried about inflation. And I think what we're going to get is in all um, global states, hyper-stimulatory policy precisely because they don't think there are any costs associated with stimulatory policy. And I think we're going to get the one thing we don't expect, which is inflation. Now, when we get wage inflation initially, then feeding into consumer price inflation, Peter, I think what you're going to see is long-term interest rates start to rise sharply. We saw this last year. Last year's 20% drop in US equities was all about the big uh, you know, 3.2% 10-year government bond yield in the US rising on the back of US wage and consumer price inflation. And when we get a real cycle of wage and, and consumer price inflation, bond markets are going to flip out, yields are going to jump, equities are going to get smoked. And if that translates into, into consumer borrowing rates, those high interest rates, if we go through a genuine inflationary cycle, then hold on to your hats because I agree with Steve. You know, you're going to see 
a, uh, a kind of minimum 30 to 40 percent drop in Aussie house prices. But for that to happen, you have to get inflation, you have to get wage inflation, and you have to see long-term interest rates increase. Can I just say one final thing? I think that we're going to get multiple iterations of this. So we got an iteration last year. Yields jumped up, equity markets freaked, central banks have cut, the ECB started QE, the Fed's doing QE, the RBA is about to do QE. I think what will happen is the first round of uh, inflation in, in Western economies with positive population growth uh, will be dismissed by central banks. They'll say we can look for we can look through this. Powell is saying this in the US. He's saying we can tolerate high periods of inflation for some time because we undershot our inflation target for uh, 10 years. So I think you're going to see central banks doing everything humanly possible to um, douse fears about higher wages and higher inflation and trying to keep global bond yields down because the debt levels are not they are not sustainable and not serviceable at much higher interest rate levels. But eventually, if inflation becomes entrenched, I think you're going to see an existential battle between bond markets and policymakers. Uh, and I think that's what could catalyze a global recession and horrific drops in Aussie okay. house prices. For the time being, and for the foreseeable future, I am very positive on Aussie house prices. Okay. And I look, Chris, I could listen to you all day and for a moment there, I thought I was going to have to. But it was a good <laughs> summary. It was a bloody good summary. But because it was quite long, and given the fact he actually has said that under some circumstances he thinks you'd be right, do you want to give us a, a nice, short, concluding st a statement, Steve? Yeah, if you could actually go to my slide too, the one for private debt levels around the world. I agree with a lot of what Chris had to say there, except I don't expect inflation uh, to be sustained. I do think there's going to be inflationary surge in America because of the tight labour market. Um, but what the central banks around the world are ignoring and what economists in general are ignoring, and this is why I got into this whole bloody debate in the first place, is they're ignoring the role of private debt and credit in the economy, and I'm saying it's crucial. So that shows you the level of private debt in Australia. It's not the highest in the planet. I've just included the countries we tend to refer ourselves to. Uh, because our, But our household debt's the highest, our private debt's about the fifth or sixth highest in the world. Uh, that's what's constraining what, what central banks can do. And then the standard neoclassical what are called DSGE models, don't include credit or debt at all. And I'm saying by leaving that out, they're completely ignoring one of the major driving factors in the economy. So you are not going to get sustained high interest rates because as soon as you do, you'll get more private sector deleveraging and fall back into a slump again. So I don't expect a global crisis out of rising inflation and uh, rising interest rates. They'll, they'll be cut off at the pass by debt service, again, driving people into deleveraging and fall back into a recession again. Bottom line is no, this okay. is a lousy way to run an economy and Australia has been the best at running an economy in a lousy way on the planet. Good luck to you. Keep on doing it. But to, to make house prices the be on all of the other society, it's a trivial nature of a society. Okay. So thanks for joining us, Chris. Thanks for joining us as well. As always, a very vigorous and interesting debate. Thank you, mate. Hi, Chris. See you, mate. See you, Steve. And finally, if you've enjoyed the Switzer TV experience, please hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.